I want to invite you to take a trip, the trip of your life. But it'll have to be an imagination because you're going back 2,000 years and we're going to land in the city of Rome. And as you're drifting along in that old city, taking in the sights, a scurrying wind picks up a scrap of paper from the dirty gutter and throws it into your face. You pick it off, look at it. It's a letter. And as you look at this dirty scrap of paper, it begins to gleam and to shine brighter and brighter till it looks like a mini sun, S-U-N. Suddenly it changes again and it has become a key and something in you tells you this is a key to anything and everything. We've been talking about a letter in the Bible that millions have read and a handful have come to understand. I suspect that you, like me, when you first read it, get nothing at all out of it. But as we look at it more closely, you will see it contains more wealth than USA, China, Japan and the whole weather put together. It unlocks all the mysteries of the universe and it solves all the key issues of your life. So while Will Yarn has read some of it, let's all look at it again. Philemon. And I'm going to ask you some questions afterwards to see what you've got out of it. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, to Aphire, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so you'll have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the saints. Therefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to order you to do what you ought to do, yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. I, Paul, an old man, now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who's become my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, now he's become useful both to you and to me. I'm sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel. Well, I didn't want to do anything without your consent, so any favour you do will be spontaneous, not forced. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back for good. No longer as a slave, better than a slave, a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. So, if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he's done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I'll pay it back, not to mention you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing you'll do even more than I ask. One thing more, prepare a guest room for me. I hope to be restored to you and answer to your prayers. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ, send you greeting, so Mark, Aristarchus, Demas and Luke, 
my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Background. This is a letter to a Christian family in Asia Minor, known then as Phrygia. The master of the house is Philemon, his wife is Aphia, and they have a son, Archippus. And they were converted through Paul when he was ministering in Ephesus, not far from Coloss, which is the place where Philemon lives. So Philemon's become a Christian and uh, he's fairly wealthy. And like all wealthy men in Rome at that time, he has slaves. If Christianity had tried to get rid of slavery, there would have been such a storm, Christianity would have been wiped out. What we have instead is a seed here that will break the rock of slavery. This is the Magna Carta of freedom. And millions of slaves have found their freedom because of this letter. So here is Philemon. He has a company of slaves. His son is a minister. His wife is a devoted Christian. And the local Christians meet in his house. When you read the word church in the Bible, it never means a building. It always means a company of believers. But now the villain of the peace. And his name, on which Paul will make a pun in playful gesture later on, his name means profitable. But he has denied his name by stealing from his master. And having made the theft, he's made his way to Ephesus on the coast and then the Aegean Sea to cross, then the Adriatic Sea to cross and then to Rome the very drain of all the misery and vice of the empire. Where like old London, there are multitudes of lodging houses where miserable scum, escaped thieves or escaped slaves or just the paupers are eking out a miserable existence in these lodging houses. What happened next, we don't know. But ultimately, he is confronted with a man in prison, but not a usual prison. He's chained to a soldier, but he's in his own rented home and people can visit him and they do day by day and he teaches them the gospel. And to that rented home, somehow comes Anisimus. Paul tells this runaway thief that the Son of God has taken the guilt of all the world, buried it in Joseph's new tomb. And that when he rose, the whole world rose with him, legally justified, if they'd accept it. So Onesimus learns that in Christ there's neither bond nor free, neither Jew nor Greek, but all one in Christ Jesus. He's only a young man and Paul comes to look upon him as his son and he looks upon Paul as his father and does all he can to be useful to the old man in chains. But the hour comes when Paul says to Menesimus, you know, don't you, you should return to your master. I can't take a liberty with my friend. I can't violate the laws of the land. You must go back. And this was bows his head and said, I know, I've been expecting it. Paul says, look, one of the ministers here in Rome, Tychicus, is going to go to your hometown. I have a letter to the Colossians, but I'm going to give you a letter to your master, Philemon. This was no easy task. Paul cannot minimise the theft. He cannot minimise the wrongness of what Onesimus has done and yet he wants to praise the converted slave. He wants to make it clear that he loves both Philemon who's been robbed and he loves the robber Onesimus. And this letter is a masterpiece of tact and wisdom. Christianity never violates the laws of courtesy 
some of the saddest pages in C.S. Lewis are where he talks about courtesy should be learned in the home, but in how many homes, professedly Christian, there's very little courtesy. But this letter is a model that would endure forever of Christian tact and wisdom. It's a very unique letter. It's the only private letter we have from Paul. He probably wrote hundreds. When this letter came to Philemon, he had it read out to the church when they met. Then they copied it out so that every, all the Christian Colossus could have a copy. And they multiplied copies. And it got to Rome and the other big cities. And finally, it got into what we call the New Testament. The heart of the letter, as I'm sure you have realised, is a gospel in a nutshell. He says, I've become a father, though I've been under lock and key. And my son is your runaway. You know, the letter is in three sections. <laughs> One to seven is praise for Philemon. Sincere praise for what that great Christian was doing in Coloss, sharing and giving. Then from seven down to about 19, we move from praise to a plea, which I'll now enlarge. Then the last verses are a pledge, where Paul not only makes an I owe you, but a you owe me, as we will see. I have become a father, even though I'm under lock and key. I have begotten Anisimus, who in time past has not lived up to his name, because his name means profitable. He hasn't been profitable. But now that he's converted, he'll be profitable to you and to me. So receive him as though you were receiving me. Do you see the gospel here? It's as though Christ speaks to the world through Paul, to his heavenly Father, and says, these sinners, I've come down into the bondage, the prison house of this world, to suffer shame and humiliation and death. And in so coming, I have begotten a great family who in times past have been guilty, condemned by the law, pursued by their conscience, and they've robbed you, Father. But I've taken the debt. Whatever they owe you, put it on the Calvary account. You know that I've paid that. And receive this sinner, indeed every penitent sinner, as though he or she was me. Please think of that. The text is telling us in parable form, that when you come to Christ, when you come back to God, he accepts you as though you were Christ. Would you think on it? Receive him as though he were me. Christ says to the Father, receive this sinner as though he or she was me. And so when you and I accept the good news, that all our guilt was dealt with, taken away, that as we were ruined without asking for it by a representative, so we've been redeemed without asking for it by another representative. And the miracle of it, the wonder of it, that good news that Duliana referred to makes the heart to sing and the feet to dance, that we can be accepted in the beloved, complete in Christ, without condemnation, despite a thousand weaknesses, despite a thousand failures every day, still accepted, still treated as though we were Christ, blessed is the man whose sin is forgiven, whose sin is pardoned, blessed is one to whom the Lord will not impute iniquity, for by grace are we saved through faith, and not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Think of the marvel of it, that God can accept sinners as though they were Christ? That we who've been thieves because 
If you're like me, you've spent many years without Christ, pleasing yourself, indulging yourself, living purely a selfish life. Thus we robbed our maker. Thus we robbed our preserver. You know, on the judgment day, God will say to many a man, I gave you everything, your life, your talents, your opportunities, your family, but you've never acknowledged me. You've never sought my guidance. You've been a good father, good son before that, good neighbour, but me who gave you everything, who sheltered you from trouble and pain and death, me you have ignored. Me you have ignored. We have all been thieves. Luther said, Methinks we are all gods in this am I. And we are. For there's no difference. There are only two types of people in the world. Disreputable sinners. The other class, reputable sinners. They're the only two classes in the world. So we figure we're there. And we're guilty. And our conscience is pursuing us. And the law condemns us. But when we hear the gospel, then we can say, free from the law. O oh, blessed condition. Christ has bled and now I have remission. Grace has redeemed me once and for all. Free from the law is a way of salvation. Never free from it as a standard of righteousness. So here is the gospel. And Paul speaks as a mouthpiece for Christ, inviting God to take back the sinner and to treat the sinner as though that sinner was Christ himself. Well, some of you have heard all that before. I've preached on that at least 50 times. But now I want to tell you something you've never heard. I guarantee it. Because I have read untold books on this letter and I've never found what I'm going to tell you. And Lord willing, there'll be another book on it soon. Why, there's Ford. And it's going to say what I'm now going to tell you. There is a precious diamond mind in this book that has not been recognised. What is it? Well, put aside all your presuppositions for a moment and look at the letter. Who is it from? Well, well let me ask you another question. Does it even mention God? 99 people out of 100 that read this letter cannot tell you whether it mentions God or not. You needn't answer. <coughs> does it mention God? Answer, yes it does, and more than once. Second question, does it even mention Jesus Christ? The vast majority of people who read it don't know the answer to that question. It does. How many times? Once, twice, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You've got it. This is a Christ-centred letter. Most people don't know that, even though they've read it. Hey, anything here about faith? Yes, it's mentioned more than once. Anything here about hope? Yes, it's there by name. Anything there about love? Yes, it's there. Anything about the church? Yes, it's named. Anything there about prayer? Yes. Hey, this is far more Christian than I ever thought, but that's not what I want to get to. What sort of man is writing this letter? Well, he's a man who knows many people in many cities. And he's a man that is so respected, his slightest wish becomes law to all his friends. So he can say in this letter, having confidence in your obedience. Hey, I don't say that to my wife, be obedient. <laughs> I wouldn't say that to my brother. I might to my sons. But Paul says having confidence in your obedience. Who is this man that knows people in everywhere in cities whose slightest wish becomes law? And what a man. Every line of this reveals the loving, generous character of the writer. He's not like other men. Hey, he's got whole races on his shoulders and on his brain and worry and concern. He's carrying churches and now he's interceding for a runaway gutter snipe. What sort of man will do that? 
He's in prison. He's got enough to think about. There are chains on his hand. There's a soldier beside him. He may be killed in a matter of months. But he takes time to intercede for a thief, for a slave. I wonder if you know what was the usual fate of disobedient slaves. Just a little while before Onesimus got to Rome, a senator was murdered by a slave. The slave was his rival for the love of a fellow slave. This senator had 400 slaves and there's an old and ruthless law that says, should any slave kill the slave master, all the slaves must die. What a ruthless, irrational, wicked law. Well, it hadn't been used for years because there hadn't been an outbreak for years. You've heard of Spartacus, but that was over 70 years back, the slave rebellion that he led. So in living memory, there'd never been an upheaval. So they take it to the Senate. Do we enact this law or not? 400, 399 innocent people, shall we murder them? And so a brilliant senator gets up and says, yes, we will murder them because otherwise we're not going to sleep at night. We'll have as many enemies as we have slaves. And unless we put fear of Jupiter into them, our heads may roll. And so the whole population of Rome stands to attention while the long line of slaves come out, men, women and children, and are executed. Slaves had no rights. They could be thrown into the fish pond, devoured by lampreys. They could be crucified, open to the ravens and the kites. They could be branded. They could be manacled and sent to the salt mines. Slaves had no rights. But here is a man who sees infinite value in a slave. And he teaches this slave that to become a Christian is better than to become a king. Think of it. To be a Christian is better than to become a king. As you read this letter, you marvel at the writer because every line reveals his character of sterling goodness. But now my main point... This letter fits like a hand into a glove with the last verses of Acts. So would you kindly look with me at the very last verses of the book of Acts. The last verses tell us that Paul, for two whole years, I'm reading verse 30, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. Boldly, without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus. So here he is, stayed in his own rented house, welcomed all who came to see him. Philemon fits like a hand in a glove with those verses which tells us, which assures us that the book of Acts is a genuine history. There's never been a more genuine document than Philemon. And it gives us evidence that Acts is also genuine. And so what? Well, Acts talks about the resurrected Christ. Acts talks about the descent of the Spirit. Acts contains the prophecy that one day the good, glad and merry tidings was to go to all the world. Acts 1 verse 8. This is a book that has miracles. This is a book about men who sing in prison and earthquakes split the prison and open the doors and they refuse to leave. What a book. But this letter, this primary document of Philemon, which has never been questioned as to its genuineness and authenticity, it guarantees there is a Paul who was in prison and it's the same Paul and the same prison that's mentioned in the book of Acts. And therefore Acts 2 is history, which means we have a resurrected Christ, which means the Pentecostal spirit has come, which means we have a God who works miracles, 
which means that even if we feel in prison, we can sing because we have a God who can work wonders. Further than that, this book puts its seal on the Old Testament. Would you look with me at Acts 3? Once you get the Acts from the book of Philemon, you get from there to the Old Testament. Look please at Acts chapter 3. Verse 18, this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Christ would suffer. Verse 24, all the prophets from Samuel on, as many as have spoken, have foretold these days. Here the book of Acts says, look, the Old Testament had prophets foretelling the coming of Christ. Now, we've noticed that the little letter to Philemon mentions Jesus Christ nine times. What did those names mean to the readers? Well, Jesus means saviour. Christ means the anointed one. Priests and kings are anointed and on occasion a prophet. So this Jesus Christ, spoken of in Philemon nine times, is going to be a king, a priest and a prophet. And now we go back to the Old Testament, to Daniel 9, unto Messiah the Prince. Messiah is the Hebrew equivalent of Christ. The word Christ means an anointed one. In the Old Testament, Messiah means an anointed one. Christian doesn't mean someone just like Christ, or there aren't any. Christian means one who's received the Spirit, been anointed. So when we read nine times in this letter about Jesus Christ, we're reading about someone who'd be a saviour, Jesus. He call him Jesus because he'll save his people. It's quoting from the story about Samson who in his death took hold of the pillars and bowed himself with a prayer and delivered his people by his death. And Matthew 1 is quoting from the words to Samson's parents about he'll deliver his people, save his people. So Jesus, the saviour, the deliverer, but Jesus Christ, the anointed one, this saviour is going to be a king This saviour is going to be a priest. This saviour is going to be a prophet. And he's the one foretold in the Old Testament. Particularly in Daniel 9, which foretold the coming of Messiah the Prince. The word translated prince means a leader or a king. So here is a deliverer. He'll be a priest and a king. He'll be a Melchizedek. You remember in the beginning of the Bible, chapter 14? Out of nowhere appears a man who rules Salem, Jerusalem it became. And his name means Melech, king, Sadak, righteousness. His name means king of righteousness, Melchizedek, king of righteousness. And he's also king of peace because Salem means peace. And there's no genealogy for him, never told about a birth, never told about a death quite unlike the majority of the prominent characters of the Old Testament. We don't know where he came from, we don't know how he died, because he's a type of Christ who had no beginning and has no end and who is the Prince of Salem, Prince of Peace, and who is the King of Righteousness. Remember Psalm 110, sit at my right hand, I've appointed thee to be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Sit at my right hand. Twelve times in the New Testament, Christ ascended to God's right hand till all the world is subject to him. So the ninefold reference in the letter to Philemon embodies so much just in the name Jesus Christ, a saviour who'd be a king and a priest, a messiah, the one spoken of by the prophets from Samuel on, even earlier, but particularly in Daniel 9, where we had a prediction that in less than 500 years from the return from Babylon, the Messiah would come while the temple was still standing. The glory of this house will be greater than that of the former. Well, that house was destroyed in 70 AD. He had to come before that. And he was reborn in Bethlehem, which was the city of David. You know there's only one David in the Bible? There are several Judases. We even have a book in the Bible written by Judas. 
I mean, the translators are a bit nervous, so they gave the name Jude. Same name in the Greek, Jude. But there's only one David, because his name means the beloved, and he points to Christ. David's born in Bethlehem. Oh, what rough years he had before he was anointed to become king. And then he never loses a battle when he's leading the armies of the Lord. How did he begin his ministry? Fighting a great giant. How did Christ begin his ministry? Fighting Satan. When you read the story of David receiving back the grandson of a rebel, Mephibosheth, who was lame on both his feet because of a fall. Beautiful picture of how our David receives us who are lame because of the fall in, in Eden. We were born lame like Mephibosheth, but our David welcomes us back. Well, David was born in Bethlehem, and Christ was born in Bethlehem. David has the one to whom he gave life, rebel against him, as David in heaven, Christ, has Satan rebel against him. But that rebel is finally caught in the fork of a tree, and when Satan puts Christ to death, he himself is crucified. You know, Genesis 3.15 is not fully understood. I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and your seed, and he shall bruise thy head. The Hebrew says he, not it. And thou shalt bruise his, not its. Hebrew says his heel. Seed of the woman, born of a virgin, shall crush, but he's still around. Well, every serpent still flailing for a while after their head is crushed. Calvary, the first um, first Armageddon, where Christ overcame principalities and powers by his death, refusing to leave the cross, not bound by nails but bound by love. So all these illusions are present in this tiny little letter which most people read and are no wiser after they put it down. The Christ who is referred to nine times is a saviour, a king, a priest and a prophet. And this book links up with the book of Acts where we find Paul in his own hired house. Isn't it a wonderful thing? When you go to Rome today, they show you the pit where supposedly Paul was incarcerated before he died. Paul was twice in Rome in prison. When he wrote Timothy... He said, everybody in Asia has forgiven me. Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Why is that important? Well, Demas is mentioned here. Did you notice? Probably not. I never did when I first read it. And when Paul wrote 2 Timothy, he was in his second imprisonment in Rome and he was in sort of a pit. Somehow he scribbled something out, handed it to the jailer and said, give it to my visitor. And that became 2 Timothy. But... Could Onesimus have ever made contact with Paul if at his first imprisonment he'd been in a pit? No. But strangely, the Roman government says, look, you're innocent, we don't know how guilty you are, if guilty at all, you can render home. We'll chain you to a soldier so you don't run off. And in that situation, he could receive Onesimus. Now, have you noticed... This letter talks about some very important issues, not only about the Saviour, not only about the Messiah, not only about church, not only about faith, hope and love, all those are there. But this letter talks about the providence of God. Perhaps he therefore departed for a season that thou shouldst receive him forever. The letter is saying God had a hand in all of this. Philemon, you're a bit mouth-bound. He never got the gospel from you. So God had a hand in him getting away from you. God had a hand in him coming to me. Perhaps he therefore departed for a season that thou should receive him forever. Paul is saying the providence of God is in this. Of course it is. Tell me, why did Onesimus go to Rome? Hundreds of other great cities. Why go to Rome? There is more likely to get into trouble from the Roman Senate, more likely to be branded, 
put in the salt pits? Why did he go to Rome? How does he find Paul? That's a needle in a haystack. Rome at that time had about a billion inhabitants. How does Anismus find Paul? This little letter is telling us our life is not governed by chance. That God is the ruler of this world. And if you are a believer, you can know that even your downs are permitted by God so you can have a better up. Life is not easy for anybody. Life is very tough. Your banker will tell you, your doctor will tell you, your employer will tell you. They'll all give you bad news. But if you believe in a God who controls all things, all things work together for good. Look please with me at the last verses of Romans 8. Romans 8. This is how we think and speak when we recognise the providence that is alluded to here in the little letter to Philemon. Look at Romans 8 and we're going to just consider very, very briefly the last verses. From 28 on, <coughs> Romans 8. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who've been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son. From all eternity, God planned believers thus would be conformed, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he called, and those he called, he justified, those he justified, he glorified. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who didn't spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It's God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is interceding for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Trouble, hardship? Persecution, famine, nakedness, danger or sword, as it's written, for your sake we face death. All day long we're considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. My dear friends, we all have tough experiences. We all have tough times. If we could believe that one verse, it would soften every blow. It would ease every burden. We are more than conquerors through him who loves us. For I am persuaded, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. Sometime, take the book of Romans and look at the end of every chapter. And over and over in chapters 5 and 6 and 7 and 8, it ends with, through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's why Christ Jesus is mentioned nine times in Philemon. The love of God is revealed through Jesus Christ our Lord. He is the chief agent of God's providence and control of the angels to control our lives for good. So here's a little letter... <coughs> that assures us of the reality. There is a God. The Bible is from him. Christ did rise from the dead. There is forgiveness of sins. And Christ at God's right hand has his hand over our lives to guide us in little and great. I suggest to you, if we really come to understand this precious pearl of supreme value in the treasury of the New Testament, suddenly the whole Bible will open up afresh. We'll see God in you, see Christ in you, see Calvary in you, see the gospel in you, understand more about the church, about faith, hope, love. If you receive 
him as myself, Paul saying, you are receiving me. And when God receives you, he's receiving you as though you were Christ. Let's pray. Thank you for this little letter. Open our eyes to see the marvel of it. May we not only admire Paul who wrote it, but the Christ whom it reveals and the gospel with which it is full, the promises that are for us, that as we believe, we are received and we are received as though we were Christ himself. Amen.